Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I am Lanisha Lightborn, the Business Development Manager for Asset Management and High Net Worth Services at the Bermuda Business Development Agency, also known as the BDA. The BDA is an independent public-private partnership, and our focus is on promoting the jurisdiction and encouraging economic development and inward direct investment. We have teamed up with STEP Bermuda for a series of webinars, which will run throughout the year. Today, we present some of industry's subject matter experts who will explore creative structuring techniques and review recent legal developments and their impact on US Chinese families with significant wealth in multiple jurisdictions. Thank you again for joining us today. And I will hand it over to the chairman of STEP Bermuda, Ashley Fife. Many thanks, Lanisha. And many thanks to all of you from wherever you're tuning in throughout the world uh, for joining us today. STEP Bermuda is delighted to be partnering with the BDA and also the uh, Bermuda Association of L Licensed Trustees to bring you these talks. And today we're delighted to have Carlin McCaffrey of McDermott, Will and Emery and Shudan Zhao of Norton Rose Fulbright to present to us on U US Chinese high net worth tax planning. It's particularly uh, good timing for a talk given President Biden's recent um, tax proposals and uh, the, the change of administration in the US. Just wanna say a little about the speakers. I mean, we're very, always very grateful for speakers to take the time to present to us. Uh, Carlin is, is co-head of the private client practice at McDermott's New York office, albeit she's presently enjoying some time in Florida. She advises on domestic and international planning for high net worth individuals, is a frequent lecturer and author in this field. And uh, among other impressive achievements, Carlin is a fellow and past president of the American College of Trust and Estate Council. Shudan's practice at Norton Rhodes, Norton Rose includes advising high net worth individuals of US tax implications of wealth transfer strategies with a focus on international income and estate planning. She also does a considerable amount of work advising in relation to CRS and FATCA, uh, advising in US tax implications of expatriating from the US or moving into the US and um, inward investment into the US and outbound investment. Uh, Carlin and Shadan have a, a, quite a bit of territory to cover uh, we've allowed a little bit longer th than usual. And so I should make myself scarce now and hand over to, I think, Carlin. Well, actually, I think Sh Shudan is gonna oh, start Shudan. us off. Great. That looks like the first slide, Shadan. You need to unmute yourself. Unmute. Oh, now I'm unmuted. Yeah. I was not able to control that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lanisha and Ashley. Thank you very much for having us here um, to uh, share with the audience some of your thoughts on planning for clients with nexus with both China and the US. This is really a very interesting time for us to be presenting to this audience. Um, as we know, tax law changes are definitely happening in the US and off offshore structures will come under even more scrutiny under this new administration. And new offshore jurisdictions are emerging, providing interesting options to clients. For US practitioners like us servicing cross-border clients, this is going to be a fun year on top of all that, planning for clients with Nexus um, with not only the US, but also China also faces unique lo local law restrictions in Asia, making the planning even more challenging. But we like challenges, don't we, Colin? Now, let the fun begin. We'll begin by predicting the future. 
A wise man once said that it is difficult to make predictions, especially when it's about the future, but every rule has exceptions. Despite the legis legislative uncertainties, there are a few things that we do already know for sure under the new um, or in the new tax plan that will come that will um, impact our clients. Colin, do you want to look into your crystal ball and no. tell us what you see? I, I wish I had a crystal ball, uh, but even so, even though I don't have one, I think we're all pretty sure that income tax rates are going to rise. The question is just how much? Under Biden's current proposal, the top tax bracket on ordinary investment income will increase from its current rate of 40.8% to 43.4. That's not so bad, but the tax rate on long-term capital gains is really gonna go up substantially from 23.8 uh, to 43.4. And that's also the, the rate increase for the tax on qualified dividend income. The current top rate of 40.8 seems high to us now, but from a historical perspective, it's really not as bad as it has been. When I graduated from college many years ago, the top income tax rate was actually 91%. Hard to imagine. And all of a taxpayer's income in that year in excess of 200,000 or about 1.7 million in today's dollars was subject to a 91% tax. On the estate tax front, it's been reported that an estate tax hike is not part of President Biden's current economic plan. But this is misleading, I guess, or could be misleading for a couple of reasons. First, we all know that changing the estate tax law, an increase in the rates and a decrease in the exclusion was part of his platform on which he, he ran for the presidency. Uh, but more importantly, part of his current plan part of the income tax proposals that he's, he's put forth will be an elimination of a basis step up at death, perhaps carry over basis, but it looks like it might actually be tax at death on all of an individual's unrealized gains, similar to the situation in Canada, but a lot more burdensome because at least in Canada, there is no estate tax, there's simply gain recognition at death. So that's, that's the real problem. Uh, the, the loss of uh, the $11.7 million exclusion is, is troublesome, but for most of our clients, uh, it doesn't really represent a significant portion of their wealth. Uh, but the, the basis problem is, is a big one that we're gonna have to be working on and gaining expertise on over the, the next, uh, next several months. What about the IRS, Judam? Are they going before, to be invigorated? Yeah, before I talk about the IRS, I really want to say that, Colin, every time I talk to you, I learn something new. I did not know that the tax rate was more than 90% when you graduated. It must <laughs> have been a much nicer time to be a tax lawyer at that time. So put a lot of pressure on creating tax shelters back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So um, we really need to give um, this current administration a lot of credit because they have correctly realized that just making the tax law uh, tougher is not enough. The key is really in enforcement. President Biden has been reported to propose a whopping $88 billion increase in funding for the Internal Revenue Service over the next decade. On average, um, that, mean, that, that would mean about two thirds increase over the current annual budget of the IRS. The government has also made it clear that the target is the wealthy people. I have some interesting uh, statistics here. It turns out that the IRS workforce decreased by 22% between 2010 and 2019, and it was left with the lowest number of revenue agents since the 1950s. The audit rate plunged by half over that period. And because the service did not have the resources to deal with people like us, the number of millionaires audited during that time fell by 72%. Um, that's actually um, pretty much my entire legal career, starting from when I was a summer associate. So I guess I missed all the fun. Carlin, how did that happen? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the story is, is too long to tell and it has a lot of chapters. Uh, there were a bunch of factors that led to it, including a desire to cut federal spending and internal revenue services per 
reported scandals that happened over a number of years since the late 90s, uh, that all led to the cuts. And, and the scandals included a report that the, the service was actually targeting right-leaning nonprofits. And all that gave Congress uh, the ammunition, those who weren't particular friends of the IRS, the ammunition they needed to argue successfully for a slash in the IRS budget. And when the IRS asked for an increase, uh, for example, in 2013, Republican Representative Ryan, who was then the chair of the House Budget Committee, uh, claimed that the IRS actually lacked the moral authority to appeal for a budget increase. But it looks like all of that is about ready to change. Exactly. And this is really significant. So if we think about the uh, the amount of resources that have gone down if the same amount would go up. So that's the flip side of what's going to happen, perhaps. So the service may not get the full $80 billion that they um, may want to have, but likely they would get a decent portion of it. More importantly, uh, the service will use advanced technology like AI and algorithm to more effectively detect irregularities in tax reportings and um, payments. The IRS officials have been publicly saying since last summer that they will reshuffle their internal resources and bring agents with different expertise together to audit the wealthy people. So they're going to include partnership tax people, international tax, trust and state tax experts, all on one team. This is a really smart move, it's a very smart move. So the service is finally catching up to the law firms what they may end up doing is to build a mirror image of what a law firm would call a family office practice group within the service. The new audit uh, campaign will also focus on clients' offshore assets and offshore structures. This is why throughout this presentation, Carlin and I will emphasize the importance of compliance again and again. Offshore structures will now require even better guidance than ever before. Now, this is the first substantive topic of today, foreign non grantor trusts for US beneficiaries. This is a counterintuitive but creative planning that Carlin has written and spoken about, and we are finding a new application for it because uh, the long-term thinking behind the strategy is particularly consistent with the dynastic view that Asian families tend to take when it comes to wealth. And also because uh, Mr. Biden is, Biden is going to increase the tax rates. This is also making this strategy maybe more appealing. Now, Carlin, do you want to tell us uh, what this uh, clever sure. idea so, is? So this is a back pattern that's probably familiar to many of you. Uh, uh, Chinese parents or other parents who are not US taxpayers created the wealth in Asia or in another foreign country. Some or all of their heirs, the natural objects of their bounty, uh, live in the United States. Most of the family's business interests are in Asia or other foreign countries. Um, the liquidity is in Hong Kong, Singapore, maybe transitioning to the US. So like many of you, with this situation, we would suggest a foreign grantor trust structure as a starting point while the foreign parents were still alive. That saves uh, significant assets from being included in ultimately in the US heirs gross estates, it simplifies US reporting during their lifetimes and saves significant income taxes so long as the parents are alive. The problem is the exit strategy. What do we do when the foreign grantor dies? So the, the typical advice is that this trust should be domesticated. It should become a US trust because it has US beneficiaries. Without domestication, the foreign grantor trust will become a foreign non-grantor trust when the grantor dies. And under the throwback regime that uh, applies to foreign trusts in the US tax system, US beneficiaries would be subject to a punitive tax regime when they receive accumulation distributions from the trust. By domesticating the trust, the foreign uh, non-grantor trust status, and along with the throwback tax would be avoided um, altogether. And the benefit of this strategy is the avoidance of this punitive tax. But the downside is that the trust has to pay current US income tax on all of its worldwide income, even income that has nothing to do with the United States. And once it's become a US trust, if it ever seems desirable to move it offshore, uh, 
planning to do that is somewhat difficult. There may be a significant tax cost incurred if you expatriate uh, a US trust. So uh, the, ne uh, the next slide uh, gives some facts that we're gonna talk about um, describing two different kinds of clients that we've had recently. Uh, in the first case, G1, the, the patriarch or the matriarch is non-US and the children are all US citizens, but they may be interested in expatriating in the future. The family assets are minority interests in a major global business and significant liquid assets. And as we'll see, this is a good candidate for not domesticating when the foreign grantor dies. In the next case, um, the patriarch, matriarch is non-US. Again, the, the children are all US citizens, but here the assets are very different. The trust that G1 is gonna set up, initially a grantor trust, owns 100% of a foreign company, a Hong Kong company, that owns a bunch of businesses throughout Asia. And this is probably not a good candidate for the foreign non-grantor trust, trust status. So let's move on to the, to the next slide and talk about why for the first situation, it might be a good idea to keep the trust offshore even when the parents dies. Because in this case, the family will have an opportunity to, to grow their investment portfolio free of US income tax while avoiding the throwback tax and the control foreign corporation and PFIC rules that Trudan's gonna talk about later on don't apply because they have essentially marketable securities. Um, they're not investing in, in foreign corporations that are, have simply passive assets. So under the throwback rules, the US beneficiaries are generally subject to a tax on something called an accumulation distribution to the extent that the trust has undistributed income from prior years, we call that UNI. There's an important exception to that rule in section 665B, and that exception says that in any year in which the distributions don't exceed the trust accounting income, the distribution is not going to be a distribution of accumulated income, and therefore it's not gonna be subject to the throwback tax. And better yet, to the extent that trust accounting income exceeds DNI, the distributable net income for the current year, the US beneficiary can actually receive the distribution completely free of, of US tax. So if the US beneficiaries are willing to accept <clears throat> a steady stream of investment income distributions every year, uh, never going above trust accounting income, the foreign trust itself is never gonna pay any US income tax, except if they have effectively connected income, which is easy to avoid. And the US beneficiaries are only gonna pay tax on the income they actually receive at current rates. So on the next slide, and actually the next two slides, we have uh, some charts that show the advantages of the compounding that can happen when you keep a foreign trust offshore after the grantor dies. So on the left, we have a hypothetical trust number one that implements the foreign non-grantor trust that tr strategy that I've just been advocating. And on the right, we show a similar pattern of investments made by a trust that's domesticated after the grantor dies. So starting from year one, when the grantor dies, the trust number one will never pay any US tax on its income. Um, and trust number two is gonna pay tax normally on all of the income. And in this chart, um, I guess this is the chart where we assume the the higher, the higher rate under Biden's, Biden's proposed increases. Assuming that the distribution is 2% a year and that 2% a year always is less than trust accounting income, the beneficiaries are never gonna get caught by the throwback tax and the trust is gonna grow year after year because of the, the miracle of compound, compounding year after year without paying any income taxes. So in only 10 years, with the foreign trust strategy, the trust has 161 million as opposed to only 131 million if the trust had been domesticated. Now this, this trust, this pattern may kind of overstate the advantage because it assumes recognition of all income 
every year. And that's probably not a typical investment pattern, but it gets, gives you the idea. The actual savings is gonna depend on the investment savings because every dollar that you don't pay tax on is gonna be invested to earn more money in the future. Well, Carla, this is all very fascinating. Um, but the clients may ask um, a few quick questions, like questions that I would have. Um, so number one, what if this steady stream of distribution is not enough to fund the beneficiaries' lifestyles? You know how luxurious um, lifestyles our clients can live. And question number two, uh, more importantly, what is the point of having an enormous amount of principal if no one can access it? And I actually have a question three. Uh, if I want to challenge you a little bit more because <coughs> Colin, because you're Colin, <laughs> is it possible to uh, plan with the fiduciary accounting income or even the very idea of income itself? Well, those are all very good questions. Let me start with the first one. If the family anticipates that the US beneficiaries may need uh, more distributions in the future, and have the foresight to plan for it, you can provide in the trust agreement that on a particular date, a particular beneficiary is entitled to receive a particular sum of money. And so long as you don't do that over more than three years, that particular specified sum of money can come out tax-free. So I, I drafted such a trust for a family recently where my client decided that he wanted his sons to get a distribution of $5 million at age 65, 5 million at 75, and um, I guess 5 million at 80. I forget what the actual ages were. And, and those, those amounts come out not only free of the throwback tax, but free of income tax altogether. So that's um, one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is to um, have a portfolio of, of trusts where some foreign grantor trust can domesticate providing uh, another source of income for the, for the family um, and others stay, stay offshore. Yeah, that's right. And in terms of the second question, I'm sure you will have a very technical, clever answer to it, but um, I just want to actually add um, a um, cultural aspect to it. Um, so the second question I asked was, what was the point of having an enormous amount of principal if no one can access it? So um, when it comes to the second uh, second generation or future gener generations, um, I have, um, well, Colin and I have had some very uh, interesting observations. Um, so unlike most of the US or European families um, that we have been working for for a long time, who believe that their descendants should have the freedom to do whatever they want, including with the family wealth they will, that they will inherit. We have noticed that most of the Asian families are actually very concerned about the impact that great wealth can have on their descendants. Asian families typically want to provide enough for the descendants so that they will have the means to fulfill uh, their potential academically, commercially, or even politically. But they almost always ask uh, how to make sure that the descendants will not feel entitled just because they're born into great wealth. Uh, the Asian families feel so strongly about these goals that they actually often reject the typical family governance model that we use for US, US and European families, where a trust would break into separate shares, per um, um on each generation, and each share will have um, discretionary distribution standards. Quite a, uh, a number of the large Asian families that we work with specifically ask to have the trust assets uh, to, to have the assets stay in one port forever while providing very specific distribution standards that are designed to enable and incentive the incentivize the descendants to succeed in their own right. I guess translating their wishes into numbers, it is quite possible that the intended annual distributions would be under the DNI or fiduciary accounting income limitations anyway. Would you agree, Colin? Uh, yeah, I've, I've certainly seen it with our foreign clients and I've seen it with some of my US clients too. There's one client I've been working with over the last couple of months who has very similar objectives. And I guess it's for, for two reasons. He's setting up dynasty trusts that he wants to, to last uh, for generations to come. He doesn't want his children to get really large distributions because he's afraid that it would disincentivize them. 
And he has an, another point of view that when he builds up a large pool of capital for his family, the larger that pool of capital it is and the longer it can stay together as one investment pool, the better investment choices it's gonna have. And so for this client, he's decided that, he's actually decided to use the pattern that's illustrated by the spreadsheets we just showed you. His children will never be able to get more than 2% a year out of this fund that he's keeping together. So that's certainly a, a, a goal that's shared by, I think, clients uh, all, all around the world. The, another way to answer your second question is to consider um, the fact that we're dealing with long-term trusts and that people are very mobile. The fact that a client's children are US now doesn't mean that those children are gonna stay US indefinitely or that their children or the children's children are gonna be US. And for that reason, it's, 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 I guess, prudent to at least keep some of the money offshore um, without paying any US tax as it grows. And it's gonna be there uh, on a tax-free basis for future generations, um, not only in the US, but in wherever, wherever they may be. So the third question, is whether we can plan with the concept of fiduciary accounting income. Because remember we said that the throwback rule and even gross income in the first place can be avoided so long as the, the distribution doesn't exceed trust accounting income. So, so what is trust accounting income? The, it's a very flexible concept. It's defined in the regulations under the code as whatever local law says, it is or what the trust instrument says it is. So long as the trust instrument's definition doesn't depart fundamentally from traditional principles of, of income and principle. So local law is important. If for example, local law says that distributions from an entity in cash are trust accounting income, a distribution from a partnership of no more than 20% of the partnership's value will be treated in most states that have adopted the Uniform Principal and Income Act as trust accounting income. So that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility to characterize relatively large distributions from a trust as trust accounting income if the trustee is investing through an entity such as a limited liability company or a partnership. What do you think of that strategy, Shudan? Well, I think it's, um, it sounds even more promising. Uh, than I used to think. But um, I guess there are a few caveats. So you and I talked to some global banks about this, right? So this is really a highly engineered structure that requires the tax advisors on the, uh, on the one hand and also the financial advisors on the other hand. So we learned that. So um, the trust assets, are, uh, number one, the caveat would be the trust assets should avoid CFC and PIVIC attribution. Uh, which would mean the trust should mostly invest in the U.S. capital market or minority interests in non-U.S. operating companies. For anyone who's interested in this strategy, um, the client's tax advisors must work closely with the financial advisors throughout the design and implementation process. This is a highly engineered uh, strategy that is not for everyone. And another caveat would come in the form of actually answering the client's question number two. Uh, as you may recall, in case number two, the family's trust holds 100% of a Hong Kong company that um, wholly owns many other operating businesses in Asia, when all the uh, G2s and G3s are US citizens. Although there are uncertainties in the CFC attribution uh, rules, uh, uh, attribution through trusts, which we'll talk about later, this particular fact pattern is actually extreme enough for the CFC attribution rule to apply, even if the rule itself is uncertain. uncertain. If the trust stays foreign, the US beneficiaries likely will be treated as indirect US shareholders under one famous example three of the section 958 regulations and will be subject to current supply of income inclusion even without trust distribution. Subchapter so J and CFC supply of income regimes don't mesh well, so it can cause very tricky complications. Uh, so as long as we are watching out for those um, um, potential pitfalls, um, I guess this strategy can be implemented very successfully. Now, we have been talking about foreign trust, uh, uh, offshore trust for about half an hour. 
then how do U.S. practitioners uh, look at offshore trust versus foreign trust after all? Uh, the distinction is actually very relevant to clients' planning. A foreign trust is a U.S. tax concept. Any trust in the world will be a foreign trust if it fails the so-called court test, i.e. a foreign court can assert jurisdiction over the trust, or the so-called control tests, i.e. material decisions about the trust are not controlled by U.S. persons. When we say offshore trust, we typically refer to the trust's governing law being that of an offshore jurisdiction. That means that an offshore trust is definitely a foreign trust, but the reverse may not be true because say a Delaware law trust can be a foreign trust because the protector is non-US. Since we have two options to use if we want to cause a trust to be foreign for US tax purposes, and since we, the US practitioners only mostly care about US tax law, what would be the situations where we think offshore jurisdictions can be qualitatively different than a domestic jurisdiction, Carlin? Well, I, th I think but while the set law of the trust is alive, uh, particularly if the set law or the grantor is going to be subject to the US estate tax, uh, there's potentially a, a, a really significant advantage of, of keeping the assets in a foreign trust that's actually a, an offshore foreign trust in an offshore jurisdiction. And why is that? Because this person, if he's going to be subject to the US estate tax, is going to want the assets in this trust to be excluded from his gross estate. And under US estate tax law, the assets would be included in his gross estate, so or excluded from his gross estate, so long as he didn't have any powers over the trust, dispositive powers, or any fixed rights to receive assets. The problem is, if he also wants to be a beneficiary and the trust is located in, physically in the United States, the trustees are here, unless the grantor lives in a state in the United States that doesn't have a public policy against asset protection trusts, the chances are the assets in that trust will be subject to the claims of creditors of the grantor. Now, the grantor may not actually worry about that from a creditor's rights point of view because he's not intending to actually have creditors seeking his assets. He's gonna pay his bills on time, but the Internal Revenue Service doesn't care about that. They take the position that if creditors can reach the assets that are in, held in a trust that you've created, those assets are gonna be included in your gross estate. And so for the client who wants to be a beneficiary of her trust, and doesn't want the trust included in her gross estate, it's worth thinking about putting those assets offshore in a, in a foreign jurisdiction with an actual foreign trustee. Right, that's um, a very interesting, that's a very important point. Then um, how about um, the fiduciary accounting income uh, definition? Um, I know that we have looked into the state law um, in multiple states in, in the US. Um, how would a uh, offshore jurisdiction's local law um, apply uh, when we want to um, plan with fiduciary, fiduciary accounting income? Is that something that you have given it uh, some thoughts on? Well, we need to know what the local law says. Um, and it would be nice if the local law of the foreign jurisdiction actually um, had the same provisions as the, the Uniform Principal and Income Act in the United States. Um, it's some, you have to, before we structure it this way, we need to talk to local council to find out, number one, what their local rules are as to differentiating between principal and income. And number two, the extent to which they would in, enforce deviations from that. So suppose you created a Bermuda Trust and provided that the determination of whether an asset, a receipt was income or principal was going to be determined under the Principal and Income Act. Would, would that work in Bermuda? This, this is, these are decisions that you and I can't make, but our, our advisors in Bermuda can help us decide. Yeah, that's right. And the way I look at it is that that means that um, um, the offshore jurisdictions of the um, or the offshore world as a whole may present more opportunities, or this is why um, the offshore world can be a better choice than the domestic jurisdictions because there is a whole range of different local laws to choose from. 
<laughs> I guess. Um, now, uh, Colin just told us what a US practitioner would think about offshore jurisdictions. Um, I can report here what we have observed, how a typical Chinese client will look at the offshore jurisdictions. First, Singapore is definitely emerging as a very appealing jurisdiction for the super wealthy in Asia, and even those in the US to set up trusts and family offices there. We have had the opportunity to collaborate with Singapore colleagues because clients are dragging us to that direction. From the Chinese client's point of view, Singapore is independent and still uh, and, um, close to home enough and has a culture that they are familiar with. They pretty much think of Singapore uh, as one basket and the rest of the um, offshore world as the other basket. Uh, we will be interested in watching um, this continued uh, development. Um, and second uh, observation we have from working with Chinese clients is that we are seeing that for some reason the, the, the Chinese clients um, tend to put the crown dependencies such as jersey and currency into one basket and the overseas territories and some other Caribbean islands into another. They choose jurisdictions based on that distinction as a starting point. This is an interesting phenomenon that perhaps deserve another separate study. Um, now, next topic. Uh, like some of you in the audience, we sitting in the US um, um, are often um, concerned um, with the IPOs that happen thousands of miles away in Hong Kong. Despite the political uncertainties in the territory, Hong Kong is entering into a golden age of capital markets. According to its homepage, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange ranked as the world's number one IPO venue in the seven out of the last 12 years. Very impressive. Just last year, Hong Kong came in as the second following the US. The IPO boom continues. We are often called upon to advise on the founders US tax and trust planning prior to some companies IPOs in Hong Kong. In our experience, these pre-IPO planning cases have the following common characteristics. First, many of the companies, especially those in the tech sector, are founded by US citizens. They were the Chinese students who came to the US for their PhDs in the 90s and the early 2000s, obtained their citizenships, started their families here, and then went back to Asia to start these successful businesses. This is why Carlin and I, as US wealth planners, uh, would have anything to do at all with the capital markets half a world away from us. Second, although the listing venue is Hong Kong and the listed company is often a Cayman company, almost all these companies have their primary operations in China and a global ambition to expand in many other continents, including North America, Europe, and Australia. We can see a typical corporate structure on this slide here. That means when we deal with these clients, we always need to warn them to watch out for the CFC PVIC issues. In particular, the CFC downward attribution rules really caught some clients whose group companies had US subsidiaries quite off guard. CFC downward attribution is not a topic for, for today. We covered it in one of our prior step presentations. Today, we'll give everyone an update on one of the issues we uh, reported on before, and we'll also cover a new issue that is emerging as a major concern. In one of our prior step presentations, we discussed how the traditional comparative analysis of various estate freeze techniques would apply in the unique context of pre-IPO planning in Hong Kong. Here is a review of our past analysis. We focused on comparing a grant with a sale to grant or trust. I am um, pretty much quite indifferent um, to these two techniques, but I know that Karen, you, uh, Colin, you um, have a strong view about this, this comparison. Absolutely. I think that grants have at least three features that make them, in my mind, a planning um, technique that's far superior to sale to grant or trust. First, the technique is, is clearly authorized by section 2702 of our code and by the regulations. While the sale for a note has sometimes been attacked by the Internal Revenue Service as a transfer with a retained interest that doesn't satisfy the rules of section 2702 and therefore is subject to 100% gift tax. Second, it offers 
complete protection against valuation mistakes because the regulations permit the drafter of a GRAT to define the retained annuity payment as an amount that's equal to the value of the property transferred to the trust is finally determined for gift tax purposes. So if my client thinks what he's putting in is worth only 50 million and the service successfully argues that it's worth 75 million, there will be no gift tax. Instead, the client will receive $25 million worth more worth of annuity payments back. So that's an important feature. And finally, assets that are transferred to a GRAT have downside protection. And most of our clients are so optimistic that they don't want to think about that. But I'm old enough to know that there have been periods of time when people have made sales to trusts for notes or sales worse than that, sales to children for notes. And the things that they've sold have gone down in value and the debt is still there. So the trust is depleted to repay the parent or the child has to use her own assets to repay the parent. With a GRAT, an unsuccessful GRAT has no adverse economic impact on the recipient. The assets that were transferred to the GRAT simply come back to the grantor with no uh, adverse economic effect to the recipient. Well, I guess the third feature on your list would be particularly significant for these pre-IPO cases in Hong Kong because a lot of these companies are biotech companies. So these companies or the value of the stock uh, really depends on the FDA approvals, which are a great uncertainty. So the values can actually really go down if you talk to the founders, if they're honest, they will tell you that they don't know how much the company company will be worth uh, like five years from now, uh, from, from, from today. So that's a very important point uh, that we talk to the clients about as well. But Colin, I guess I can add a fourth feature to your list, uh, at least when it comes to these pre-IPO planning. Um, as we pointed out in our prior webinars, in these cases, one unique issue is how Chinese law would view a sale to grantor trusts. Uh, these companies almost always have their primary operations in China. So the founders who are US citizens oftentimes uh, would also be Chinese tax residents as well, especially in the years leading up to the company's IPOs because they must be on the ground in China operating the business and getting it IPO'd. A sale, a sale to grantor trust is protected by revenue ruling 85-13 under US tax law, under which no gain would be triggered when a grantor enters into a transaction with, with his grantor trust. However, there is no parallel rule under Chinese law. China had its own tax reform in 2018, focusing on refining the definition of Chinese tax resident and tightening the rules on taxing Chinese tax residents overseas, overseas income, among other things. For these pre-IPO cases, their Chinese tax issues are often scrutinized intensely by the Chinese tax authorities and the founders and executives' personal tax are also scrutinized. As a general rule, we tend to warn clients of this Chinese tax risk associated with a sale to grant or trust strategy. However, recently, Carlin and I have had clients who have done their homework and who made up their mind, who were not to be persuaded and specifically asked for a sale to grant or trust because of the GST benefits. So we were challenged to think long and hard how to satisfy the client's demand while mitigating the potential Chinese tax risk. This diagram shows the solution we came up with. We had the client make an incomplete gift of his interest in the Cayman company to an intermediary trust, and then have this intermediary trust sell the Cayman company interest to the family trust. From the US law's point of view, the sale will be treated as if made by the client himself to the family trust, which is quite a straightforward analysis. What is significant here is that it worked from a Chinese perspective. This is primarily because Chinese law currently does not contemplate taxing a Chinese tax resident's foreign trusts. And most of the mainstream Chinese tax advisors we work with feel comfortable taking the position that in this case, the trust should not be subject to Chinese tax. So we should not need a Chinese equivalent of revenue ruling 85-13 at all. When planning for a client recently, 
we had the occasion to run this analysis informally by the Chinese tax authorities that were reviewing the companies and the founders Chinese tax position prior to the IPO. And we were told that the position was blessed by the Chinese tax authorities, or at least they did not seem to be bothered to try to come up with any theories to fight it. So uh, this is an update that we would like to report on following on one of our prior presentations. Hopefully it will help you think about the planning for your clients in a similar situation. But today the new issue is uh, what Colin is going to tell us about on this slide. Okay, so, so this slide um, has a, a different fact pattern illustrating another set of issues we worry about. And it's in fact a typical fact pattern um, that we've seen. So this client is a, a US citizen and he says he wants to set up a, an offshore trust to hold his public company shares because his Asia-based advisors told him to do that. His wife and all their children are US citizens, just like many other founders of Hong Kong companies. Uh, but he does have extended family in Canada, which is not unusual. And still some of the family is back in, in China and he may want to benefit them. So we told him that he really shouldn't focus on or, or think very hard about whether to have a foreign trust or a US trust here because he doesn't have a real choice unless he's willing to accept a complicated reporting regime with no real tax benefits during his lifetime he should set up a trust that's US based, at least during his life, with an important caveat. And that is that if he wants to be a beneficiary of the trust and avoid possible inclusion of the trust in his gross estate, he might be willing to accept the problem of the, the complications of being offshore. Um, his, his shares are currently worth about $70 million. And we can assume that maybe the gift tax value is something between 30 and 40 million after discounts. And his Asia-based advisors told him to take uh, 23 million worth of this stock and put it in an offshore trust and he would never have to pay any US tax again, any income tax. So that of course is not true. And, and probably most of you actually realize that. Um, so the problem is that if a US person sets up a trust offshore, and there are any beneficiaries at all that are US citizens or any possibility of distributions being made to US persons, then the trust is gonna be a grantor trust under section 679 and the client is gonna pay tax on all of the income. So there's no, uh, no income tax savings at all. Uh, he then might ask once he told him that, like we told him that conclusion, well, suppose I just set up a foreign trust just for the benefit of my Canadian relatives and my my Chinese re relatives. That's highly unlikely since his children are US, but suppose that's what he, he asks. The problem with that is that there's another rule that says when a US person transfers appreciated property to a foreign trust, that's not a grantor trust, it's not treated as owned by somebody else, then that transfer is treated as a recognition event. And so he would be treated as having recognized gain in this case, probably equal to the full value of the assets he transferred to the trust because it probably has a very low basis. So none of that seems like a very good idea. But for this client, what we would likely recommend is a traditional estate freeze technique. One of the ones that Chudan was just discussing, a sale to a grant or a trust or, or a grat. Um, it could be offshore, but again, there's no reason to be offshore except for the creditor's rights issue, um, unless the, uh, the client is willing to accept a, a great deal of complication. The offshoreness of the trust uh, would become relevant when the trust turns off grantor trust status. So when the client dies, um, if he set up his trust offshore, it was a grantor trust during his lifetime. When he dies, there's another, another problem that has to be faced because at that point, the trust would automatically become a foreign non-grantor trust. And that could be a problem. So why would that be a problem? Well, it, it has US beneficiaries and you haven't reached the conclusion that you really wanted an offshore trust. Your, your beneficiaries could be facing the 
throwback rule, and they may not be willing to accept that kind of regime because they don't want to limit themselves to a small amount of distribution every year. Uh, but in any event, when the grantor trust status ends, the grantor is going to be treated as having recognized gain on all of the assets in the trust. And all of that, the tax or all of that deemed income will have to be reported on his or her final income tax return. Now, there are, there are ways um, probably to avoid it, uh, but it's, it's a complicated planning exercise to avoid the 684 tax when the client dies. So what's striking about this advice is that we've seen that this is the kind of advice that's frequently given to our clients uh, by, by foreign advisors, even those that are associated with well-known institutions. The market environment for professional advisors in Asia is obviously very different from what we're familiar with in the United States. And the burden is on us to provide the correct advice to the clients and help them do the right things. Interestingly, when we work with, with advisors such as you in the Caribbean and the Crown dependencies, we're not seeing these problems. Um, in fact, you have become so careful uh, with these issues that practically any time we wanna do something with a trust with a US grantor, you require us to give a legal opinion before we do anything. And while that can be annoying at times, I guess it's, it's right to be cautious, especially when the US government is cracking down on these offshore structures. So as we, we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, offshore jurisdictions are great in certain circumstances, but the heightened scrutiny over placing trusts and, and managing money offshore means we have to have a much deeper understanding of what's going on and help our clients to avoid the various pitfalls that they face when they do this kind of planning. Very good advice, Colin. Now let's uh, look at our next uh, topic. Um, I am often amazed at how fast things are changing. Maybe just two years ago, a lot of the advisors focused on planning for Chinese clients were primarily concerned with pre-immigration planning. Now we are hearing a lot from the Chinese clients how frustrated they are about being stuck with their green card. And here's a typical fact pattern. The client came to the US for school in the mid to late 2000s, worked in the US for a few years and obtained his green card, has been filing as US tax resident ever since for almost 10 years. He went back to Asia to start a successful business and now he's worth half a billion dollars. His families are all Chinese. Given that his business opportunities are in Asia and that tech people like him who are worth this much typically think of themselves as global citizens and cannot uh, care any less about the US permanent residency. So he is desperate to get rid of his uh, US green card and get out of the US tax net entirely. Unfortunately, as we know, giving up the green card in his case is not straightforward. Oh, we should still be on this page. Um, it's not straightforward uh, because he can easily trigger the exit tax because he would meet the $2 million asset test. He likely would fail the income test as well. And significantly, for many of these tech founders who are not well advised before finding us, they likely have compliance issues in relation to their Asian business interests. Now, there is an interesting planning opportunity that may be available to some clients because there is a gap between the income tax residency test and the transfer tax residency test. For a green card holder who has been filing as a tax resident for 10 years, even if his facts may allow him to treaty tie break out of the US, taking a treaty position at this time would constitute um, an expatriation for tax purposes. So he's indeed stuck with his US income tax residency status in a way. However, his transfer tax residency analysis can be quite different. As we know, the transfer tax residency test is essentially a domicile test, focusing on one's intent and is fact intensive. Courts have consistently held that one needs to look at the totality of the facts and no one single factor is in itself determinative. Importantly, 
courts have held that having a green card is just one of the factors that should be reviewed and that the statements one is required to make in his green card application are not necessarily, not necessarily determinative in deciding whether he has the intent to reside in the US indefinitely. Here is a list of select cases where green card holders, uh, green cards or similar immigration document, documents were involved. I would encourage you to read them if you're bored on one Friday afternoon, because some of the cases are actually quite entertaining. In one case, the service was essentially saying that, Your Honor, if you think that the statements the taxpayers made in his green card applications do not reflect his intent to live in the US indefinitely, are you suggesting that he was lying in his green card application? The judge said, I don't care whether he lied in his, when he applied for the green card in my court. When I look at all the facts today, I just don't think that he wants to live here. Um, these cases are all um, very interesting um, going back decades. Um, um, it's important to note these uh, fact patterns because this is such a fact um, intensive test. And here is a list of the factors that the courts consider significant when reviewing the facts and circumstances of any particular case. The takeaway is that for clients like this one, it is important to recognize that just because he has a green card doesn't mean that he's necessarily a US transfer tax resident. However, very careful analysis must be conducted before deciding that he's not a transfer tax resident. Even if the conclusion that he is not domiciled in the US can be tentatively drawn based on the current facts, it is extremely important to continue to monitor the facts over a multi-year period, especially if the client intends to utilize his non-domicile position for planning. Otherwise, the client's US tax exposure could be 40% of his assets. Here, this gentleman has basically cut all his ties with the US and has no intention of returning to live in the US. It is possible that he's not domiciled in the US anymore. In this case, he should be able to gift away his non-US status assets, which is basically all his valuable assets without US transfer tax implications. One helpful thing to do is to advise him to make a $20,000 cash gift within the US, which would allow him to file as a gift tax, uh, file a gift tax return as a non-resident. This gift tax return will not be determinative in terms of, tr of his transfer tax residency, but it can be one of the helpful facts that he should gather to build his case. The client then goes on to settle a Singapore trust for the benefit of his Chinese families because the value of the underlying assets are very significant and growing, they want to put it into a trust. Interestingly, as mentioned, Singapore is emerging as a much preferred offshore jurisdiction for setting up trusts and family offices. How this would interact with US planning is a topic for another day. Here, it is important to note that this client must carefully exclude US persons in the Singapore trust or any offshore trust he would set up and fund. By carefully excluding U.S. persons, it really means eliminating any U.S. person's reasonable expectation of benefiting from the trust. We would need to read the regulations of 679 very carefully. It's a very um, elaborate set of rules. Um, you will be surprised by some of the uh, rules. Otherwise, the offshore trust would continue to uh, will be treated as a grantor trust to him, and he would have to continue to pay U.S. income tax on the gain. The client came to us for advice as to how to keep up his green card. But after all the analysis and planning, he suddenly realized that there would be no need to give up his green card after all. And he's not alone. There is really more than one way to think about the expatriation analysis for these clients. One important caveat here is that we should always consult immigration counsel when we are dealing with green cards. The tax law planning opportunities and the immigration law requirements pull in different directions, opposite directions. Immigration law requires the green card holder to retain sufficient nexus with the US for the green card to continue to be valid. The two bodies of the law do not entirely overlap. The takeaway is just don't forget to talk to the immigration colleagues. 
Now, Carlin, over to you, the next topic. So we, we only have uh, two minutes left, but maybe I have time to do this one last example. So Sudan talked about the income tax planning that's available for a green card holder who's not domiciled here. But now suppose we're dealing with somebody who's actually a US citizen. The problem that she's gonna face is that she can't so easily give things away. Uh, but if all of her uh, beneficiaries are non-US citizens and non-US persons for income tax purposes, there are still some interesting things that she can do. And, and this situation that's illustrated in this slide is actually reflects a client that Shudan and I have been working with over the last several months. She lives here, her son and all of her grandchildren uh, live in China, uh, Chinese citizens. She's a US citizen. Uh, what we can have her do is create a US trust with her appreciated assets uh, using either her exemption amount to make a tax-free gift, or maybe she can fund it over time with grants or um, so, uh, similar kinds of techniques. And key to make this plan work is that the trust needs to be a non-grantor trust. And the goal here is to sell the appreciated assets without paying US income tax. So if the assets are in a um, US non-grantor trust and the assets are sold and the gain is recognized by the US trust, the US trust can avoid income tax on it by on all of that gain by making a distribution in the same year that it recognized the gain to a foreign non-grantor trust. And the client it was able to create this foreign non-grantor trust without running into the 679 automatic grantor trust rules because she actually was able to create a trust, the only beneficiaries of which were foreign people because all of her children and grandchildren were foreign. So that's one way that's open even to US, um, US clients, US citizen clients to avoid some income tax and some gain. Well, I just got a, a notice that we actually have 15 minutes more. I thought this was over at uh, at, at two o'clock or 3.30. Um, all right, so so Shudan, you can go on then to the next the next slide or the next topic, the loans. Yes, right. So, um, so I talked about what a green card holder can do uh, to save income taxes and Carden talked about what a citizen can do to save income taxes. Now, this is the technique uh, is a, that is available to both green card holders and citizens as long as they have non-US people uh, in the family. Um, in the domestic context, a much used technique is to have parents loan cash to children who will then invest the amount as a way to shift income from family members in a higher tax bracket to family members in a lower tax bracket. The effect of this income shifting technique will be turbocharged when the arbitrage is not just between different tax brackets, but between taxable and tax free. For example, a US person family member, instead of investing the money herself and paying US income tax on the gain diligently, she can loan the amount to her Chinese family or a foreign trust settled by this Chinese family, charging the prevailing AFR rate. The trust should have either um, no US persons as beneficiaries, or if it does, the loan would need to be structured as um, a qualified obligation. The US family member will pay a modest US income tax on the interest income, whereas the Chinese family member or her foreign trust will pay no U.S. income tax on most of the income generated from the investments, including U.S. source income, that is capital gains and certain interest income. This technique can be used, um, like I said, by both U.S. green card holders um, and, and citizens. The caveats are, number one, if what is being loaned is appreciated securities, then the gains may be triggered upon the transfer unless section 1058 is complied with and section 1259 and some other sections are avoided. And two, 
uh, we really need to monitor Chinese law developments, especially how China will ch uh, uh, change its law to tax its tax residents' offshore trusts. In fact, the Chinese law development will impact many of the techniques that we discussed today, uh, which depend on the Chinese side of the family not having to pay tax in both the US and China in connection with certain transactions. Now, uh, I believe we have another 10 minutes. So I would like to um, talk about um, a case um, uh, about Carlin's favorite client, um, a young billionaire in his 30s. And the issue we want to share is the um, CFC attribution rules. Throughout the presentation, we have been saying, we have been mentioned, we have been mentioning CFC and PFIC attribution rules um, all the time. Um, this is certainly a, a, a very important um, area of the law. On CFC attribution, um, so here's the client, a young Chinese billionaire who set up a New Zealand law irrevocable trust for the benefit of his wife and issue, as well as the number of Chinese family members. Initially, everybody was Chinese. The trust was set up to address Chinese law concerns. The trust's distribution standard is absolute discretionary and had never made any distributions. The wife brought the children to the US and ended up living here at some point and accidentally became US persons. The trust is a foreign non grantor trust and is a 75% shareholder of a Cayman company that is now worth $5 billion. Another shareholder of the Cayman company is a US citizen who owns 22% of the company. When that other shareholder found out that our client's wife and children ended up living in the US, he was very upset and angry, demanding that something must be done. Why was he so worked up? As a 22% shareholder of the foreign company, the business partner would be a section 958A US shareholder, meaning um, he would be a direct or indirect US shareholder of the Cayman company. Under section 951A, only section 958A US shareholders would be subject to support of income inclusion if the foreign company is a CFC to him. When determining whether a foreign company is a CFC to him under section 957A, both direct indirect ownership and constructive ownership um, by, a US, by US shareholders will be taken into account. So section 958B, constructive US shareholders are not actually subject to tax but may cause trouble to section 958A US shareholders. His advisors told him that our client's wife and children by living in the US would be costing him millions of dollars because they could be treated as indirect or constructive US shareholders through attribution um, through the clients for non grantor trusts. So Colin uh, was called upon to come up with all kinds of arguments to say, no, 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 it's not true. Uh, please calm down. And I was called upon to look up the authorities and and help to calm everybody down. We try to say that uh, our client's wife and children should not be treated as Section 958A indirect US shareholders because the only guidance on CFC indirect ownership attribution through trusts is this famous example three in Section 958 uh, regulations, which has a very extreme fact pattern where all the beneficiaries of a foreign non grantor trust are US persons and distributions were required to be made or were actually made. And here, our client's trust has three out of the eight identifiable current beneficiaries being US persons. And the trust had never made any distributions and the dis distribution standard is discretionary. So we argued our case was distinct distinguishable from example three uh, in the regulations. Not quite convinced, the business partner's advisors further argued that our client's wife and children could cause him trouble under the CFC constructive ownership rules. The scant guidance on this particular issue is as listed on this slide. Uh, it will be this slide, which would eventually point us to section uh, 7520 factors. Under the section 7520 regulations, the standard uh, 7520 factors would not apply to so-called restricted beneficial interest, um, which is the interest that we have here, 
and the special section 7520 factors would apply only if the beneficial interests are ascertainable, quantifiable, and predictable, which is not our case here. Basically, neither the special nor the standard section 7520 factors would apply to the discretionary beneficial interest in our case. The regulations finally say, oh, in that case, uh, you should apply a catch-all facts and circumstances test. But again, when all we are asked to rely on is the facts and circumstances test, it's simply not clear. This is a tricky case because arguably, our client actually has a good fact pattern because it's a discretionary trust that has never made any distributions and only three out of eight identify, identifiable beneficiaries are US persons. When we talk to peer practitioners, we actually talk to our colleagues and even colleagues in some other firms. How do you feel about this case? Most of the people will say, well, in that case, uh, likely uh, the attribution rules should not apply. So this is a, a case that we typically would think of um, as having um, good facts. But here, uh, our bit clients, business partners did not want to rely on arguments when millions of his dollars were at stake. So we um, uh, came up with the idea of restructuring the trust so that it would become an irrevocable foreign grantor trust. We need the trust to remain irrevocable for Chinese law purposes. And because the client and the wife are very young, they are fine with the distribution uh, restriction imposed by an irrevocable foreign grantor trust. Technically, even with a foreign, foreign grantor trust, all the CFC indirect and constructive ownership distribution rules would still apply. And the same worries that the business partners had should still exist. However, in the 950, um, um, section 958 um, regulation, there is a small section that says that when multiple attribution rules apply, then the rule that results in the highest ownership uh, of anyone would control. So the rule resulting in the foreign grantor being treated as the 100% owner of the foreign company trumps all the other rules. It was quite an exercise. Um, the takeaway here is that the rules are really not clear. We simply have to decide when to take a position and when to restructure to eliminate risks. Um, I actually miraculously have four minutes for the, to report to you the status of the PFIC regulations. Um, I would like to say that our report on the PFIC final regulations um, are timely and important. After all, the Treasury has tried many times um, and has made us wait almost 30 years since I was in kindergarten. Here is the review of the Treasury's past attempts to provide guidance. Um, unfortunately, uh, what the final regulations say, which came out um, earlier this year, finally, what the final regulations say uh, um, is um, that it is still, uh, the Treasury is still not ready to provide guidance. In the preamble to the PFIC final regulations, it specifically points us back to the 2013 temporary regulations, which provides reasonableness and facts and circumstances tests. This is just not helpful. To the best of our knowledge, um, this CAM at the bottom of this particular slide um, should remain the uh, only authority directly on point uh, in terms of PFIC um, attribution through trusts. Although this term is not particularly helpful because the fact pattern is very extreme. Our clients' cases are not that extreme. Um, if anyone is aware of any ruling or IRS memos or notices uh, on this particular issue, please uh, let us know. Um, under the um, CFC regime, um, it is direct and indirect ownership that can result in actual tax consequences, whereas constructive ownership mostly just cause trouble to others, like our client's wife and children, causing trouble to the business partner. With so much uncertainty surrounding the attribution rules, it is hard for either the, tax, either the taxpayers or the services to say definitively whether the 10% threshold requirement under the CFC regime um, um, is met. That's the CFC regime. By contrast, under the PFIC regime, where there's no ownership threshold requirement, Ownership attributed through trusts falls within the category of indirect ownership. So it is quite possible 
that U.S. beneficiaries of a foreign non-grantor trust would need to pay tax when they don't receive any distribution at all, which is a potential problem acknowledged by the Treasury in the preamble to the PIVIC final regulations. Um, I hope now you understand why throughout this presentation we have been so nervous about the CFC and PIVIC attributions. The reason is simply that there is in, not enough guidance. With that, I guess I can say that I am perfectly on time. Now we have 15 minutes left for questions. And I see no questions. Maybe Ashley, you could ask us some questions. Yes, I. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, fantastic. You may not be able to see me. I can see you. Okay, great. You and Randall. <laughs> great. Wait. <laughs> We're a pair of fun specimens. Thank you very much. That was uh, covered a lot of material and, and, and very engaging. Uh, I just had, I thought perhaps I'd start with a few observations that might, might lead to uh, some, some discussion. There was, in your talk, there were some uh, observations about um, a lot of Chinese families looking or perhaps preferring one trust as opposed to separate trust for different family groups um, with advantages for, for pooling uh, assets for investment purposes. Uh, I'd just make some observations about that and perhaps it's 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 also re reflective of the huge amounts of, of wealth we're, we're seeing in, in structures um certainly in bermuda but elsewhere also uh we're certainly seeing a, a lot of um desire to set up dynastic um trust often without uh any perpetuity period and a number of jurisdictions um, and in, including Bermuda, enable uh, trust to be to be set up without having a a, um, a, a trust end date, and uh, that I'm not sure uh, whether, in terms of U.S. domestic trusts, whether that that's an issue or whether there's a number of jurisdictions that well, we have, we have um, a number of jurisdictions that allow that as well. The, my jurisdiction doesn't, New York doesn't, but but Delaware does, Nevada. Um, in some cases, you have states that allow very long periods of time. So Florida, for example, you can have a trust for 360 years. And that seems to satisfy most people's dynastic urges. So, sure. so we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, another, I think, and from the, the traditional European US approach of wanting to perhaps split uh, large structures into to smaller uh, smaller trusts for specific family groups. Um, part of the rationale for that also may be to protect those particular trusts from claims from other members of the family in relation to the trust assets and also to, to protect against um, requests for disclosure to keep Information in respect of uh, one, one's one. Uh... Those are those are very good points because the thing that yeah. worries me about these dynastic trusts that never break up is that at some point there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of beneficiaries. And, and that's exactly not as a trustee manage all that the information flow and absolutely and and making uh, decisions having to exercise discretions when there is so much information to take into account and also trying to protect that that information. Uh, right. and, and I thought one obs observation that you made that I, I also see, um, not just in, in relation to trust with, with Chinese families, but uh, families from elsewhere as well, is this idea of not wanting younger uh, beneficiaries or to know how much, um, to know about the trust or to know how much the value of the assets in, in, in the structure, because that may... Uh, lead to an expectation and right. perhaps influence um, behavior. Yeah. And that's where, that's where disclosure can be a, um, a, a particularly key issue uh, in circumstances where trust, trustees uh, from a, a common law, English common law perspective and, and also throughout uh, Commonwealth jurisdictions and jurisdictions including Bermuda, trustees have the duty to account to, to beneficiaries 
so that um, while the beneficiaries may not have an absolute right to trust information and, and the, the trustees have discretion as to what to be disclosed, the certain information such as trust accounts uh, right. that would, would um, prima facie uh, be ordinarily disclosable. And we're, we're, in, we're increasingly seeing um, decisions by, by families and trustees made about who's included in, in the bene, beneficial class for that reason. And also increasingly seeing uh, information control um, mechanisms included in, in the terms of the trust with the view of uh, restricting information. Um, can, I, for, can I chime in here? Oh, so um, we are actually de dealing with one case um, uh, um, at the moment where the uh, settler feels um, extremely strongly that the beneficiaries should not know that the trust exists. So in the US, um, it appears that at least Delaware would allow it. Um, so this is what we call, uh, what we call a silent trust in the US, a quiet trust. Now uh, the client understandably would have following questions, like what if they find out and they want to challenge it? So the question is whether or not the local law would allow the no contest uh, clause. The no contest uh, clause in Delaware is actually interesting. The statute says that Generally, it is the, um, the, the, the clause is respected unless the beneficiary can successfully challenge <laughs> the, the provision. So I don't even know how that would apply in reality. But those uh, definitely, those are the issues that we are seeing um, among the Chinese clients. And uh, in, in the US, like Colin said, Delaware is a jurisdiction that we actually use a lot uh, for multiple reasons and um, as a domestic alternative to um, the offshore jurisdictions. <laughs> Can I ask a question as you're talking about pre preferred jurisdictions? As you were going through the presentation, you had a slide that talked about Singapore versus the world and Caribbean, Caribbean versus crown dependencies. Um, and I had the impression that Singapore is uh, becoming the more popular jurisdiction internationally. How does the Caribbean rank versus the crown dependency? What, what's causing the preference and what is the preference? Well, I'll, I'll let Colin talk about her experiences. One thing I've heard from other colleagues is that um, um, they like the courts in Jersey very much. That's one thing I've heard. And um, they, for that reason, uh, they structured um, enormous uh, um, assets um, in Jersey because they like, they like the courts. Eventually, you, you structure um, trusts up front, but you need to anticipate what happens when something goes wrong. I guess that's one thing people look at. What do you think, Colin? I, I think that that's right, although um, Bermuda seems to be an attractive jurisdiction for many clients. You've been around a long time, you have a stable system. So we do have clients yeah. who like to use Bermuda. Yeah, it's a, a comment that we typically get uh, as we're talking about Bermuda with other jurisdictions is that the Bermuda courts are very well respected. Uh, and there's a number of unique features of Bermuda law that allow uh, amendments to trust structures fairly easily when it's expeditious. And we've yes. uh, preserved the Hastings rule in Hastings Bass statutorily and a number of other things. So, you know, I can appreciate the importance of the courts uh, when it comes to it and the ability to allow foreign practitioners in to argue a case uh, is often very important, which is something that happens here in Bermuda. One, one of the things, and, and uh, before Ashley gets to another question. One of the things that I found interesting uh, was as you touched on, <clears throat> on Biden's uh, uh, approach and some of the things that he's talking about doing, and we're hearing him pushing for minimum taxation globally uh, and a number of other international objectives. Uh, do you see the US moving more in the direction of perhaps adopting CRS uh, and supporting some of the other international uh, objectives of the EU, the OECD, and FATA. That would, I, have, I haven't seen much conversation about that, but it does seem like a logical extension of, of Biden's kind of broader international view of things. Um, he seems to want to cooperate with other countries to a far greater degree than our previous president did. So it wouldn't surprise me, but we have so much disclosure now anyway. Um, it don't make that much difference. Yeah, so and we do have one question here um, from somebody in the audience um, asking, is it a correct understanding that for US citizens, it's beneficial to have offshore trusts? 
which accumulate income tax free? And does this change when the settler dies? Well, it's um, while the settler is alive, if the settler is a foreign person and it's a grantor trust, that's the most advantageous trust of all for US people because there's no tax consequences when they receive that income. When the grantor dies and it becomes a foreign non-grantor trust, the answer to this question was, I guess, the subject of, of our the first example we went through. If, if the client's children are willing to accept annual distributions that don't exceed DNI or, or um, current trust accounting income and are looking to build um, a tax-free capital base offshore, then a foreign trust can be very advantageous for US citizen beneficiaries. Colin, in answering this question, what if the uh, settler is US? Can he still do that or can he only do that with a certain type of assets? I didn't, what was your, the first part of your question was, can they? Or what if the settler is a US person, a US citizen who wants to set up an um, offshore trust to accumulate income tax uh, free of US income tax? Well, can they yeah, yeah, we discussed, he can't do that while he's alive, at least if he has US beneficiaries, but we can arrange to move trusts offshore when the client dies and we can then he can ach achieve for his U.S. children the same advantages that we just went through, at least under current law. Under current law, once he dies, all of his assets get a step up in basis and they can be moved offshore without any tax consequence. If Biden's tax proposal is passed, um, there, well, actually, if Biden's tax proposal is passed, that result isn't going to change. It's true that there'll be capital gains at, at death probably, but then after the tax is paid, he can move the assets offshore and after death achieve this tax-free accumulation of a capital base. I just had another perhaps uh, extension or, or further observation to make in relation to disclosure. Uh, we And disclosure mechanisms in light of the concerns that we, we spoke about. Um, while the, the trust duty trustee's duty to account is to beneficiaries. I, I think, well, there may be um, some developments in, in that, that regard. In, in, um, for example, where we had a case um, in the matter of information about a trust where the, the trustee provided that the trustee had a, dis broadly, had a discretion to dis whether or not to disclose information to, to beneficiaries, but required the protector consent. And the, the, um, in that case, the protector refused consent to, um, to the trustee to disclose uh, trust information to a, another beneficiary who had a, a material interest in the trust fund. But um, I think importantly, the court rec um, recognized that that provision in the trustee was valid, albeit that the, the, the court had a, uh, as part of its inherent supervisory jurisdiction, um, if that um, information control mechanism, if it determined that the information control mechanism had broken down, um, it could order, it re retained the power to order disclosure as it did in that case. But mm -hmm. I think what we might increasingly see um, information control mechanisms, perhaps to um, that will be recognised by the court that involve um, consent or, or of protectors, and that that may be a, a means of uh, limiting information to about, the, for example, the, the the size of the trust fund to, to younger beneficiaries. Yeah, I think yeah. that's fine if, if what you're trying to do is to protect younger beneficiaries. Yes. At some, at some point, um, a, a settler ought to want his descendants to have access to this information. I mean, who, would he trust more somebody who's appointed in the future that he has no control over as opposed to her own descendants to have this information? A, that would be a difficult choice to make. I, I suspect it, it may be uh, along the lines that uh, beneficiaries who are currently receiving distributions and uh, are perhaps of a certain age that uh, a court may be more likely to to grant them disclosure um, right. in, in circumstances where uh, 
for example, protect a refused consent and the, the more remote or young, younger generations um, be, uh, because that the, the court may be likely not to grant them disclosure because it's not perhaps may not be in their, their interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the case that Ashley's referring to, there were a couple of problems uh, when it came to the actual application of the clause. And that was that the protector was a beneficiary of the trust and uh, the other beneficiary who was seeking information had a fixed interest in the trust. So uh, rather than being a mere discretionary beneficiary with the right to be considered, they had an actual identifiable interest in the trust. So the court had a hard time saying that a beneficiary who has an identifiable fixed interest in a trust shouldn't have access to information about how the trust is administered. And the fact that there was this protector mechanism uh, was viewed as somewhat flawed because the protector had a vested interest, if you will, in not disclosing the information through to the other beneficiary. But, sounds sounds uh, like a sensible result. Yeah. So, did you have any other questions, Randall? I I had one that's a little bit off topic. What your first slide uh, talked about the changing tax rates, and I I believe Carlin had mentioned it uh, about changing the nature of of the income. And given that we're in Bermuda. There may be some people who are working for insurance companies listening to the, the presentation. Uh, do you have any quick thoughts on insurance wrappers? Is this something that's I, going I, to I become think more is, popular? This is going to be a boom for private placement life insurance, both offshore and onshore. That'll be the, the, I, sort of the last tax shelter available if uh, <laughs> President Biden's reform goes through. <laughs> and, I, and I was wondering how I could be the one who got the $20,000 gifts. <laughs> no, do I have to be a U.S. citizen? <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sure. Um, just one final question. I just wanted to, if you could perhaps clarify or re reiterate the rationale uh, of providing for fixed distributions in, in trustees from, a, I think it was in the context of DNI and UNI. We have this exception and ordinarily a distribution to a U.S. beneficiary will be treated as income to the extent of, of her share of the trust's current income in the year. But there's an exception to that that says that if the trust original trust agreement says that on a particular date, a particular amount must be distributed to a beneficiary, and that's over three years or less, then those distributions are not treated as income. They're just treated as tax-free distributions of principal. And so the US beneficiary won't be taxed. It's an exception, but you got to plan for it in advance. It's supposed to be in the original trust document. Many thanks. Uh, just one final observation is that uh, I appreciate that uh, there's a, there seems to be a lot of momentum for the Chinese to uh, utilize Singapore. And, and we, we certainly see that ourselves, but often we, we see that there's a lot of confidence in some of the offshore jurisdictions, trust law, and some of the benefits that Randall outlined before that may not exist under Singapore law. So while assets might be held by a Singapore trustee, um, the, the, the trust may well be governed by Bermuda law, for example. That, is that something that, that you tend no, I, to I actually prefer to have my trustees in the jurisdiction to which they're subject. But I, I, I understand that some people prefer the other model. Sure. I yeah, coming, it... coming back to Ashley's um, observation. Um, so I would just like to echo one uh, point that Carla made during her presentation. Um, I think um, the Caribbean islands are more matured as offshore jurisdictions, especially when dealing with uh, structures that has US connections. So in terms of um, avoiding pitfalls and um, just avoiding tax disasters, um, uh, you guys know when to ask uh, what questions uh, from the US tax lawyers. And I think this is very helpful to the clients, although the clients don't necessarily appreciate that. Well, at least advisors like you do. We're part of the way there. <laughs> okay, well, 
I just want to thank you again for taking the time to deliver this um, uh, presentation. Uh, very thoughtful comments and, and thank you very much for uh, responding to our questions. And I just want to mention that uh, if there's any questions uh, of, the, of the speakers, please by, by all means reach out to them directly. And please stay tuned uh, uh, for more uh, step talks, step bolts, BDA talks um, in the future. Thanks again, everyone. All Thank the you. best for the weekend. So long. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.